Welcome to the SED Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, Geophysics for Today and Tomorrow. Dr. Adriana Ramirez, Chair of the SED Europe Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori Weitzel, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation, followed by an extended question and answer session. During the question and answer session, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. We will also accept some questions as we go. Dr. Kurt Strack is president of KMS Technologies, KJT Enterprises Inc, specializing in integrated seismic electromagnetic technology for land and marine exploration, appraisal, drilling, and production monitoring for the geothermal and the petroleum industry. Present emphasis is to drive the technology enabling smooth energy transition to zero carbon footprint. In that, KMS Technologies pioneers borehole, borehole to surface and marine electromagnetics to link with 3D seismic earth model. Kurt also serves as adjunct professor in the Earth and Atmospheric Geoscience Department and Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Houston, Maya Dal University in Bangkok, and at Yangtze University in Wuhan, China, where he uh, teaches borehole geophysics and electrical methods for petroleum applications. He also teaches at other universities in China, Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and Germany. Previously, he was chief scientist for Baker Atlas after various management positions. There he built the research de department and supported the development of numerous new logging tools. Prior to that, Kurt pioneered LOTEM, transient electromagnetics for hydrocarbon exploration development and advanced borehole geophysics technologies in Germany, Australia, and the USA. Kurt received a PhD from the University of Cologne and a master's degree from Colorado School of Mines. He worked over the past 25 years as consultant, university researcher, and R&D manager in the geothermal for the petroleum industry. Kurt has over 200 publications, one textbook, and authors or co-authors more than 30 patents. He received two Fulbright scholarships and numerous international grants and awards. His interest is integrating geophysics with other disciplines, technology transfer, and project development. He is a member of SPWLA, AAPG, ASEG, BDG, DGG, EAGE, EEGS, GRC, SPE, SEG, and TSEG. He was co-chair of the technical program for the IPPC in Bangkok in 2012 and is, an active, is active in many committees. He was the industry representative for the IAGA EM division and still provides frequent workshops at their biannual meetings. The SPWLA granted Kurt a Distinguished Technical Achievement Award in 2003 for new logging technologies. SEG granted him the Regional Fessenden Award for the development of thorough case, through case resistivity and 3D induction logging. The Russian Academy of Science selected him a foreign member and gave him the Kepista Gold Medal of Honor for his innovations to borehole geophysics and pioneering work to surface, to surface geophysics. Kurt was distinguished lecturer for the SPE in 1998 and 1999 and SPWLA in 2004 and 2005. In 2007 to 2008, he received the SEG President's Special Services Award. In 2012, Kurt is co-recipient for KMS Technologies with the Cecil H. Green Enterprise Award from the SEG. Without further ado, please let's welcome Kurt Strack. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm always surprised how long my short version of the bio can be. Um, in any case, so this is uh, lecture number two, part number two of advanced electromagnetics for geothermal and hydrocarbon applications. Um, today we will talk about some applications and the last lecture that um, uh, Laurie and Adriana talked me into is um, to say a little bit about my career, which will be sometimes early next year.
First, um, I will give a brief summary of the previous lecture. I'm aware that we have some people in the audience that do not have a geophysics background. So I'd like to make it as simple as, we, as I can. Um, and um, I also noticed that I forgot to run the spell checker. Sorry about that. So Laura, you get a new version of this uh, PowerPoint after the, oh, it will be recorded, so, so be it. Um, I'll start with a subassault application followed by a subsoil application and then over geothermal to reservoir monitoring, which is really the future application for geophysics. The intention in the European Regional Advisory Committee is to um, support applied geophysics and the interest in applied geophysics. Um, and we feel that that can not only be done by talking about geophysics, but also giving some examples. And that's why we generated this lecture series. To summarize, last time I introduced that um, electromagnetics is the part of electricity in geophysics where we have acoustic, sound wave, gravity, um, which is essentially the attraction of masses and magnetics. We will see some of these uh, later on being used. For those of you is what, uh, to illustrate what we measure, you can take a voltmeter and measure the resistance, uh, switch it onto resistance measurements of minerals like pyrites. And uh, you see that it has very little resistance and sandstone has a very high resistance. When you apply this to oil and geothermal reservoirs, you need to look at it in context of water or reservoir fluid saturation. And reservoir fluid saturation is always a mixture of water and whatever reservoir fluid um, is there. That means in geothermal reservoirs, you have uh, colder fluids and hotter fluids. Uh, and in oil reservoirs, you have essentially oil, a gas in fluid form and water. And um, in the subsurface, water is usually called brine because it has very high mineral content and uh, sand. And of course, sand can also be carbonates, which is essentially uh, cooked uh, sand or chemical rock. Hydrocarbon and geothermal applications are all geared towards characterization of a 3D cube, a 3D volume with geophysical measurements from the surface, offshore, and in boreholes. And this summarizes it. Here we have some high value targets. And today I will look at sub basalt, shown here and here, and sub salt, as well as an example for geothermal, shown on the right here. And you'll see this slide again. Historically, most geothermal activities are along the ring of fire, which is the um, margins of the continental plates. And those are high um, entropy geothermal reservoirs. And these circles show where electromagnetic um, measurements have been successfully used. Unfortunately, the color had changed. I couldn't fix that. And um, since the SEG, there was a talk in the recent advanced and road ahead workshop, we can today focus on applying geothermal everywhere at any time by using lower temperatures and more efficient heat extraction techniques like closed circuit single welds. Um, and with those techniques, we can then support the energy transition to more green energy and also take care of our greenhouse gases. For oil reservoirs, we usually have the oil in very small, very um, thin layers in the subsurface and we have tight sands uh, that contain also shale. And we are trying to distinguish the change between oil and water as well as the change between drilling mud and the reservoir fluid laterally from the borehole with borehole tools. So here we are talking about 
two to 10 meters in normal case um, at approximately three kilometer steps. So we're talking about very small targets. It becomes very obvious that surface geophysical methods, in particular electromagnetic methods, do not see these type of changes and thus borehole techniques are um, needed. And in fact, in borehole measurements, electrical methods make up more than 50% of all measurements. If we look from the surface, we can characterize a hydrocarbon reservoir as a thin resistive reservoir. And here are the hydrocarbons. And if it's thick enough, we have electrical charges at the surface and uh, negative charges at the bottom. If it's even thinner, you have some uh, double layer effects. Um, and this gives rise to an anomalous response in the borehole log, which is shown on the left here, we can see high resistivity for hydrocarbon bearing reservoirs. Hydrocarbons are always high resistive. The below the hydrocarbons is always water. That means the hydrocarbons flowing to the top and the reservoir. So this is also known as the water lag. There is something specific about thin resistive oil reservoirs. They give an anomaly which is commonly known as applied geophysics in applied geophysics as direct hydrocarbon indicator. And of course, it is not direct at all. It's an indirect one, because what you really see is the charges at the interface. You do not really see resistive layers themselves. You can see the resistivity contrast. So much from, for what I've said last time, I will start with the case history for subversoil applications. Volcanoes give you these nice roots, but some of the most important subassault applications are in India and in Brazil, and there we have trap basalts. Those are basalts that come through uh, when the lava flows through very thin fissures and spreads out almost horizontally over a large area. Um, and that's very unique for those two areas. Uh, when I was a student, my dream was to apply electromagnetics in both areas. Today, that's no longer a dream. It's actually routine in both countries. Um, we are talking about uh, case history from India, where controlled source EM was used. And I'll explain some of the methods when I talk about the case histories. Why is seismic so difficult? In normal basalt areas, and I'm not talking about Iceland, where in Iceland you can say, well, they are stacked up like a bunch of tennis balls and you get diffuse scattering. Normally, basalt flows much smoother and trap basalt is much smoother, but it has very high velocity. When seismic waves go into a high velocity medium, they don't get scattered back. They essentially get trapped when you lose the seismic energy. And that's why imaging under basalt layers is extremely difficult. It can be done, but the success is extremely costly and limited. Basalt is resistive. Um, it varies between 20 to 400 ohm meters. You can have higher resistivities, um, but you barely ever have lower resistivities. When it's hot, it's conductive and it becomes a geothermal target like in, uh, for volcanoes and when you're looking for a heat source. The contrast to sediments is high because 95% of the world's sedimentary basins have resistivities between 3 to 30 ohm meters. So the contrast is in all cases very high. For, same, by the way, for carbonates. Carbonates have also high velocity. They also eat up the seismic energy um, and have a high resistivity contrast. The target in this case, and in most cases, uh, to date is to look for the amount of prospective sediments underneath the basalt layers. Um, in particular, in India, it was totally unknown how much sediments was below, and you will see that in a second when you look when we show the a priori information. The data is actually very old. The work was done at the end of the 1980s. Um, the drilling was done um, in 1999, with the results being available two or three years later, and it wasn't another um, five or eight years later that we got permission to 
um, publish only a restrictive part of this. There was a lot of work being done in this area, and the area is Sarashtra, which is south of Pakistan. Um, we acquired 350 sites in two months. The data was of extremely high quality, and this was the first CSEM data that was quantitatively interpreted using 3D numerical modeling. Um, Here is the survey area, and you can see from the Google map the outline of the Deccan trap flow at the top. Um, we had to go through a lot of hoops to get uh, geologic maps from the UK uh, that were not available in India, and when they were, foreigners couldn't hold them. Um, Google Earth made it much easier, so I was essentially in lockdown in Libya when I made this slide, and I said, man, we didn't need any maps. Um, we carried out a survey covering the area from east to west and north to south and many lines. I'm only focusing on some of them. Um, the original information was acquired using deep electrical soundings, um, using commercial equipment, and at that stage they would use some funky interpretation. And they came up with a diagram like this. Um, Nobody believed it, including the geophysicists that acquired the data. It was also part of our project and subsequent um, activities. So he doesn't have any bad feelings about this because that was the state of the technology had at that time. And um, all they were looking for is the sediments underneath these basalt layers. Just to give you an idea up front, the layering is much flatter and there are multiple basalt layers in the section, which has been revealed through numerous um, offshore CSAM surveys over the past um, uh, 20 years. What did we do? We had a transmitter that sends a, switches a current, sends a signal in the ground, and with increasing time, this signal propagates outwards um, and downwards and the currents are flowing from plus to minus here, so flow perpendicular to this. We recorded um, at all sites magnetic and two electric fields. Um, at that stage, our processing was so stable that we didn't distinguish which component was which, and uh, we got very good, very quick results. At the receiver for each of the switching, we get a signal, then we flip, the sec every second one and we average it and smooth it and process it like commonly done in geophysics. These are some pictures of the Indian crew. This is the Indian transmitter. That's a hundred kilowatt transmitter. And we were already at 400 amps with that transmitter at that time in basalt, which uh, is quite good. As I said, about 370 sites were acquired, about 400 amps. The cost of the survey was 10% of a seismic crew budget. So our project partner, ONGC, had a lot of money left over after the project because they had budgeted like they would budget seismic work. And the processing was done in a 24 hour turnaround time. I'll show you some examples. This is a typical section that would come out, out of a line where everything is horizontally layered. The next one I've taken one out where we spend a lot of time to understand the 3D effects. And we see here, these are the electric and magnetic field mix. We see something happening here like a dike. So if you adjust this and you would see the dike clearly here. We then use different imaging techniques and in all of them we saw the 3D anomaly. Subsequently, we sent the guy who acquired this particular these sites back. I said, didn't you see anything? Nope. And then he came back with this picture. So there was a dike at the surface. For those of you um, that know a little bit more about electromagnetics, that is unusual because we never really know where the information comes from, underneath the transmitter, underneath the receiver, or halfway in the middle. So we used... Um, 3D modeling to verify that this information was correct. We generated 3D data and inverted it in various forms subsequently. And after this study, one of the most important results was that 
the best information we would get was from looking at the conductance for the top two layers, because we're looking for the Mesozoics, the profile itself, the dike is in this direction, and here's a picture of the dike, and the profile goes perpendicular to it. So this is the direction of the profile. The transmitter is here, with respect to the profile going this way. And um, the uh, joint inversion sees more than the magnetic field alone. The electric field is clearly biased towards the resistive dike, um, but the most reliable results is, of course, when you want to drill on this, is to use an estimate for both of these, for all the conductances. Uh, here is the map of the different survey lines. So this covers Sarashtra. And um, from this, the well that was based, drilled on, based on this is in the area of the highest conductance, which means the largest number of sediments right here. And here is the um, analysis from the well. And you have essentially a 1.3 kilometer thick layer of uh, basalt, and then about um, 1.4, 1.5 kilometers of sediments, followed by more basalts. There is a well drilled offshore Gujarat in the Kutch, which is the Gulf between India and Pakistan. They had actually this basalt layer is two and a half kilometers thick, and they drilled accidentally through it, and they found oil. And so now um, all of the exploration leases in India, offshore and onshore, have to have electromagnetics with it. So um, they always carry out electromagnetic service. Um, it's not clear how much they use it yet. So the interpretation was done together with the client. The well was drilled on the results and ONGC claims that the predictions were within 90 to 95%. Uh, it's been impossible for me to get the actual log data to verify that. So I have to say ONGC claims that. Uh, the survey was designed using a modeling and feasibility three years before the survey and it all turned out correct. I'm mentioning this because I found the feasibility work another 10 years later. Uh, I was quite surprised that this was another one of the examples where careful work predicts it correctly. Um, sub basalt imaging can be done with a controlled source CM and magnetotellurics. Um, NGI did magnetotellurics at the same time as we were doing the CSEM. Took them a few years longer to produce the results, but uh, magnetotellurics is now the standard in India. The EM applications have matured since then. Uh, magnetotellurics usually gives a background model and controlled source EM is used for more detail. Next, we are going to subsoil imaging. And here we are using magnetotellurics. So we have the electromagnetic field from the Earth's magnetic field getting into the Earth. It generates at strong resistivity contrasts some uh, charges, and these charges, um, frequency dependent, give you a response at the surface where we have here some um, empty uh, receivers laid out. The problem with subsoil is that seismic is really, really weak in getting any information from subsoil, even the most advanced. Processing, and I'll show you a more recent result in the next in this example at the very end. Um, and that processing was done half a year ago, um, and you can essentially see nothing in the salt bodies. This is from the Gulf of Mexico, from an AAPG explorer. Um, the example from Germany: a seismic was blind. The geophysicists wanted the top of the salt. The geologists the flanks. Uh, there was no resistivity logs available, only resistivities from water wells, extremely strong cultural noise, a lot of power lines. And uh, we carried out a 2D feasibility and noise inspection and spent another two weeks for parameter testing. And then production started and we got 360 MT sites in two months. Uh, the data was drilled successfully. 
And there's a special issue that is sponsored by the European uh, Regional Advisory Committee and in interpretation coming out in November. And that contains the write-up uh, from uh, with the client being the first author on it. And he reprocessed um, the uh, seismic data uh, recently. So the area was right near Bremen, and you can imagine you have Hamburg, Bremen, and Hannover nearby. So all with airports, there's a lot of electromagnetic noise here. And it's part of the South Permian Basin. Um, so it's right there. This is the seismic. Again, you can see next to nothing. This is the salt dome, according to the fantasy. Um, this is the target area. The reason why they went for alternative techniques because in Germany, they don't get any more permission for additional drill sites. So they have to drill on one side and have targets either on that side or drill through the salt dome. So it gets very complicated. Um, here are some of the results from the feasibility. We calculated the whole profile. We got the model built from gravity and some um, research in um, literature for the resistivities, bundled them together and calculated here the top of the salt is at, um, um, is at uh, uh, lower periods, which means it's, high, uh, it's uh, 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 deeper and here um, it's shallower. So the shift in these two told us that we should be able to see the salt drop. And we only wanted to see the outline. We had no intention to see the overhang. This is the gravity data, and here is the second vertical derivative, and the second vertical derivative gives you the clear outline of the salt dome. Superimposed are the uh, MT lines. The cross lines were acquired at 50 meter station spacing, and the other lines were acquired at 100 meter station spacing. And Henke is the uh, senior also of um, this paper. This is the data. We used um, an array system uh, at that, of that vintage. And we have um, uh, eight electric field measurements and two magnetic field measurements. Because the magnetic field varies little laterally, we can use the same magnetic field for all of the, for the four different sites to get uh, the MT quantities and apparent resistivities. The original data is relatively noisy and we have to apply some robust processing. Uh, that's here on the right side to get the data smooth. And the same for um, another side. And this is a side over the salt dome where you can see the separation between the two curves. These two curves are uh, vector quantities in perpendicular direction. So one sees the salt and the higher one and the other one doesn't. Then the data was 2D inverted um, and a stable model was obtained and this was a stable model. And then the most important part was the integration. On the left, we have the first integration with the second derivative of the gravity. And um, you can see here, this is the original model, this is the gravity. And we are trying to update the model by adding a 3D rendering to it and visualization to understand what's happening. And these are different profiles and do all of this for all of the different mines. The result is shown here. And you can see how the salt dome and the overhang show up. Um, and again, this is the white outline is the second derivative of the gravity. Uh, this is the new integrated model and this is the old model. Uh, is a significant difference. Um, we ask ourselves is why don't we have a stronger resistivity contrast for the salt dome root? Um, and then later, I found a publication that came out five years after we interpreted the data um, in a Dutch uh, geological journal. And if you understand a little bit about logs, these are, this is the gamma ray and this is very typical for sand shale sequences. So the magnetotelorix will essentially see the horizontal conductivity of the shales, which will be low. Um, and, but we really have a lot of the um, uh, sand shale sequences around the root here, and that reduces the resistivity contrast. 
So it's not being washed out, it's more something that's natural for um, that part of the South Permian Basin. Here is a new um, interpreted seismic, and we now see clear effectors, and the well was based on the new seismic and the MT. Um, and if we compare the new seismic with the old seismic, we can see here that um, a significantly improved seismic image. And um, for those of you who know a little bit about seismic processing and by pre-step depth migration, you can imagine how many hundred thousands of dollars the client already spent on the seismic processing before they actually did the MT survey. And if I believe correctly, the total survey was maybe 600,000 euros or so. So that was really um, um, good money spent and it gave them a much more comfortable drilling target. Next, I will talk about uh, geothermal case history. This is one of the few geothermal case histories in sedimentary basins in Hungary. The objective for the geothermal is to, um, uh, is to look for low entropy targets because they were only looking for hot water to build spas and recreational facilities for tourism um, which actually the objectives may change past COVID-19. Um, the Hungary did acquire about 4,000 MT sites, um, relatively decent data. We could not use a single one because similar as Northern Germany acquired for 20 years, every year, so many MT sites, there was no information in the upper five kilometers because of noise. The data was so poor that there was nothing there. And so we couldn't use it to build any of the model, which is very frustrating because uh, I knew the guy who was responsible for acquiring all of this data over 15, 20 years, long retired. Um, so it was very sad that that could not be used. And I'll show you what type of data we used to come up with the result. We carried out MT and gravity survey um, and interpreted both of the data sets independently, but cooperatively. So one model was directly fed into the other model and we used similar workflows. I'll explain a little bit about it in the interest of time. I had to cut some of that short. Uh, one well was drilled afterwards and uh, the 3D models were redone uh, as close as two weeks before they hit the target, passed the report, it, just to make sure that everything was consistent. Um, and when they drilled the well, we were at uh, 1600 meters, about 30 meters off in predicted depths. And the first well delivered immediately four megawatts, which was a really big success. These are the areas. The reason why these areas are so sparsely distributed in Hungary has nothing to do with geophysics. Simply the mining authorities do not allow any geothermal licenses where they have uh, exploration licenses. So for sure there's no geothermal where they're looking for oil. Um, ha ha ha. So that's why they were spread out like this. What area are we looking for? Uh, I have to read these names. I'm looking at the screen. Uh, I think it's here. No, yeah, this profile here. There's a lot of data and a lot of reports. And we only used some for presentation. So here we look at the quality assurance. We have the data uh, displayed along a profile as a plant resistivity and phase for both of the measurement directions and X, Y and Y, X direction. And below we have the uh, 2D inversion and we compare them. And of course, we would always focus on areas where we have um, anomalies, but the consistency is quite good for all of these data sets. So um, how did we process the data? Um, all of the data was 2D inverted to some error criterion, uh, some consistency error and smooth uh, models. 
Um, then we subtracted an, a, a resistivity regional field, which we obtained out of the average of a large number of models, um, not just statistically averaging it. So there was some smart averaging using an understanding of the geology and limitations that would flow into that averaging. And we determined a regional field and then used the reference field for the um, uh, resid resid residual resistivity profile so that we could get these processes where in gravity you use the residual gravity profile and could focus on anomalous zones in the interpretation. Here's the gravity data. It's hard to see for you, I assume. In red is the uh, calculated and in green is the observed gravity. And um, obviously when the inversion is done and the model has been um, adjusted and inverted, uh, these curves match and you don't see any difference between those curves anymore. And this geology was then derived, not just from geology, that was derived from deep seismic by a geologist, important. And this geologist was the most important tool we actually had during the survey. And he still works for the same company in Hungary. Once every year, I get a, an email for him that he wants to do something like this again, but then the funding doesn't show up. Um, and then we um, essentially identified from the gravity and the um, electromagnetics, geothermal zones, those were zones with anomalous resistivity where the resistivity was lower and the density was lower, meaning higher fluids. And remember, we are looking for higher temperatures, higher, more water. Um, and so this is then the map where you have this. And here is then the map derived from the seismic where you look at fault zones. And then you are essentially combining fault zones from the seismic with the resistivity zones and those become your preferred targets. Sorry about that, this was a mouse. So this means that we have a fractured area, we have lower density, lower density means higher porosity, higher porosity means more fluid. We have lower resistivity which means higher temperature. So that logic gives you a build target. And we started then again from an interpreted uh, structure map from the seismic, and then looked at numerous locations along this, where would be the best build target, and then recalculated all of the 3D models, the final 3D models, and made sure that the models were still consistent with the data. They were not the optimal model, but it had to be consistent until we got all of this information together. And this defined a drill target. Here is an example of where the resistivity, low resistivity and gravity anomaly overlaps. Um, and here these have been projected and a well being drilled. And this is the well where, it, where they tested it and they derived that they got four megawatts. Next, um, I will talk about monitoring applications where you have essentially surface receivers and a surface transmitter, and you are trying to do some type of monitoring. In most cases, you are monitoring, um, well, I'll talk about it later. So when you monitor for hydrocarbons, you are trying to improve the hydrocarbon recovery by 20 to 40%. That is huge. That means less wells, higher efficiency, and much lower carbon footprint by at least 20 to 40%. Probably even more because it's not a direct linear relationship. For CO2 monitoring, uh, one of our client calls it carbon safe. They wanna save the carbon and which is essentially a carbon capture and sequestration. And we are now in the process of setting up a survey in one of the largest um, a carbon monitoring test site in North Dakota. I don't think it's confidential if the client happens to be listening to this. Um, oops, sorry. I have to go back. Geothermal reservoir monitoring <coughs> is important for higher production efficiency. And I will show one example slide 
where we were trying to understand where the hot and the cold fluids are, and also to monitor reservoir safety for induced seismicity. You don't want to produce geothermal fluids and have all of a sudden some houses nearby disappear. So um, induced seismicity monitoring is mandatory in most countries for most geothermal reservoirs. I'm still pushing that people also use electromagnetics because uh, from everything I've seen so far, electromagnetics works much better than seismic does for those applications. We got the idea about this by modeling a reservoir where we inject at the surface, this is the reservoir at 18 kilometer steps, we inject the current and we are replacing here the hydrocarbons with fluids, with time, and you can see that the reservoir, which is outlined here, is channeling it. And uh, these voltages are actual voltages. If you multiply them with the CSCM moment and so forth, you can see that these are very strong and the milliwatt range are very big. Um, a monitoring layout is you usually have a boundary and you're trying to monitor a flood front if you do water flood monitoring. For CO2 monitoring, you try to get a baseline level in an area, and then you are trying to see as the CO2 develops. And the reservoir itself that you're trying to monitor is below. Um, and somewhere here and there is a transmitter. The only thing I'd like to mention is, in those cases, you should have two transmitters at uh, different directions so that you are sure of what degree, or what degree you need to use three-dimensionality. Once you build the difference at measurements, even if the Earth is one dimensional, immediately you get a three dimensional response. So immediately you need to use 3D modeling. So that's why you need multiple measurements. Here is the system that we used in Asia. Uh, one was a 100 kilowatt system, the transmitter is here, and the other one, no, this is 100 kilowatts, that's 150, and this is 150 kilowatt system. Uh, and this is 195 channels, um, being able to record CSEM and micro seismic at the same time. This is one of the receivers. You see the geophone here. This is all the uh, spaghetti for, these are the electric fields and uh, somewhere here is a magnetic field hookup as well. This is the data uh, that's recorded in one of these receivers, electric and magnetic field and the two geophones. Um, for obvious confidentiality reasons, I can only show some uh, very um, anonymous results. So uh, what we have here is uh, directly two kilometers above the water flood at about two kilometer steps. Um, we have, um, after two days, a 30% anomaly. This is the data on the left. On the right side, you have the percentage difference uh, of those two data sets. Here, when you display the amplitude logarithmically, you don't see any difference with your naked eye, but you still get changes 200 meters away. And at 400 meters, I would say you are inside the noise level. But you can still see it because this is where the reservoir changes are. Uh, but I wouldn't interpret it. it would, I would acquire more data. Um, this is the... Uh, directions, the transmitter is in this direction, x direction, this is x and y, and these are the two data sets. This is the one with the 30% anomaly, this is the one with the noise. From 3D modeling of the anisotropic model, which was derived from an anisotropic well log, um, we can clearly see anomalies on both of those sites. Um, we already tested all of the casing effects because uh, one of our colleagues at one of the multinational oil companies said as well, we always get more anomaly in the data because of the casing. The casing is not the problem. We believe it's current channeling into the flooded area of the reservoir, which enhances that the actual anomaly is stronger than what we get through 3D modeling. Um, and um, anyway. I cut out how you would measure that. You can also measure that with uh, borehole measurements. Um, next, we are going to uh, CO2 monitoring. And um, uh, here's an example from Park. 
um, is from EMGS for an offshore application where they derive the synthetic model for CO2 for 2020, 2030, 2045. And then they simulated the data and then they inverted the data and they could see the CO2 in the inverted data um, uh, relatively clearly. But we also learned from this that we need denser data. The reason why I said this is offshore because an offshore typically have one kilometer spacing. If you're lucky, you get 500 meters. Um, and you need denser data. You need anisotropic models. I do believe they used anisotropic models here. Otherwise, this would be more striking. And we need better 3D inversion methods. Clearly, the 3D inversion they use, and they have probably the best in the world, is not accurate enough in order to see um, uh, fine changes in the data. And that is consistent with um, our experience over the last 30 years, that the data shows you a lot more detail than what you get out of the data by inversion. Um, and again, I said you need anisotropic models. This is a typical example for an anisotropic model, which you get here, and then you lay out multiple lines directly over the boundaries that you are trying to image. The next example looks at production monitoring from a geothermal reservoir in the Imperial Valley. And there, the problem is that they are planning to increase the production of the power plant from 30 megawatts to 50 megawatts, but they have no clue where the warm and the cold parts are and where to drill the wells to optimize the production. So we carried out the feasibility, uh, measuring noise data, integrated the log itself and the 3D seismic surfaces and simulated a survey with a transmitter here. And this was a survey like this because of the survey area itself. And these are the noise measurements. Then we combined the noise measurements of the uh, produced um, and not produced reservoir. So when you produce a reservoir, you are reducing the temperature. Uh, because this is a power plant, it's a high temperature reservoir. And so the uh, produced reservoir are the lower curves. These are voltage values. Um, and the uh, um, actually lower temperatures, which should give you, you know, it's right. No, the higher temperatures and lower conductivity should give you a stronger signal. I think this is reverse. I think I screwed up here. But anyway, so one is one and one is the other. And, um, and then what we do, we just optimize which system and acquisition parameters we use and then decide on the survey layout. Um, now next, I'm trying to put what we've seen in these uh, case histories with what's happening in the background to give you an estimated guess of the future. I wish I could do that for the US election, but I can't. Um, and this will be recorded. Transition to green energy. Clearly it's going to happen everywhere in the world. Um, the legislature is going in that direction. Uh, it clearly is going to happen. This will open up huge new markets. Uh, huge opportunities. We see so many geophysics opportunities. I was just working with a green energy services group and they just started a few weeks ago and already people are asking for 10, $12 million project bids um, because it's, it's going very fast, even in the US. Um, the other part that's very important is that CO2 will be injected in the earth. And we all know that everybody in the world is focusing on the climate change, but the biggest CO2 pilot projects are still happening in the US. Uh, hydrocarbons, there's going to be a transition. So uh, hydrocarbons will still be needed and the hydrocarbon industry will have to um, reduce the CO2 footprint. And you do that by monitoring your um, reservoirs. Um, and the novel feature is earthquake prediction for the dynamic process. I didn't include it in this presentation, but this is also for the younger students listening to this. So they can see that it's not only all about money. 
Um, now, but I do want to tell you, uh, money is always the driver of good science. So if we look at only the enhanced oil recovery market, because those are solid numbers worldwide, and here's the reference. Um, this is from Grandview Research. The market was 2015, 20.4 billion. That's much bigger than the entire geophysics market, just then holds temperature. The only geophysical measurements are temperature and pressure. There was another talk about heavy oil at the recent advance and road ahead section by Aminio Pasalacqua. And he clearly stated that we needed to do more geophysics because the value was humongous and also the reduction of uh, greenhouse gases was phenomenal if you apply more geophysics. So we can see that this is one of the biggest markets. In addition to this, CO2 markets and the geothermal markets. <coughs> so I think that the future for the younger generation is more in the um, smart application of geophysics, not just in exploration. So uh, same final slide as last time, what will um, uh, we do in the future? We'll acquire denser data, seismic and EM. It's just like uh, seismic will give you the outline of the reservoir, EM will give you what's inside, like a cup, the, you know, the boundary of a cup, and you can tell the person next to you, oh, this EM has milk or water or um, whiskey inside. Um, you can integrate, we have an integration integration of surfaces ball measurements to reduce the risk and we will integrate land and marine because there's many many larger prices to be had when we take land technology offshore and with that i'd like to thank you all right thank you very much kurt another excellent presentation so uh, we have a, a question uh, our first question is how do you overcome the problem of electric line noise during surveys in Germany? Funny questions. Um, we are just in the process of writing a proposal to address exactly that. Germany is one of the difficult places. And when I did my first measurements in Germany 30 years ago, I almost went to the frequency domain to be able to measure in a narrow frequency band. Uh, but then we found ways to overcome it. Uh, but that's not enough. Um, you have to do more, and th that's the justification for the project that we are just applying for, to take this technology to Germany and prove that we can do more. Um, it's, it's not easy, but it can be done. I can tell you that there are Italian teams that are doing it, uh, and they're doing always measurements in Germany quite successfully. Um, so why can it not be normal? I don't know. We'll have to look at it. I think there is a bigger problem in Germany and that's DC trains like in Slovenia. DC trains are really difficult to overcome. All right. Uh... I should share my picture. I took it off so that way I can focus on scratching my head and holding my nose when I talk. Okay. Um, our next question, um, well, versus a statement. Thank you so much for your presentation. The example in slide 52 shows weak BTI anisotropy. Uh, can um, you mention an example of strong anisotropy? Uh, what are the main differences that you could expect in that case? Uh, this is very, very normal. This is a sedimentary basin in Asia producing oil field. Um, we have other examples. We get this data out of a lot. When you do modeling, you always use something that fits better. Um, when you work with real data, you don't. You use a log to derive these, um, and then you have to use the values you have. So the reservoir itself has a higher anisotropy, and here is a lower one. So we have seen everything. Um, normally you have um, this type of anisotropy. The error in uh, the amount of, if you calculate from the resistivity logs, 
the um, um, original oil in place, which you can from the vertical and horizontal resistivity, the um, not including the vertical resistivity gives you an error between 20 to 40%. So even these small anisotropies give you a minimum error of 20 to 30%. Um, since the event of having 3D induction logs, I have not seen examples in the literature where the improved reserves were not improved by less than 30, lower than 30%, uh, which is amazing because we sold the development project for that tool on the basis of 15%. So the anisotropy has a very, very strong factor because it's a nonlinear process. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it, that this is a very weak one. It's still a very strong in terms of resistivity. That's why if you don't calculate a 3D anisotropic model, you may as well not do it because your error is very large. In sedimentary basins, if you talk about carbonates, it's a different story. All right. Um, the Deccan traps uh, basalt rocks in India. Uh, uh, could you uh, explain a little bit more about um, the maybe the noise and uh, that you might get from those and the, uh, the challenges no in 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 um, resolution. No noise. The data was perfect. Still, it's one of the best data ever acquired. They only have power lines, and uh, to the villages, they don't have that many high voltage power lines. Power lines partially locally generated, and now they are working on different geothermal and local plants. Blah blah blah. But when we measured there many years ago, there was very little electromagnetic noise. And yeah, of course, there was a lot of electromagnetic noise, but it's not synchronized with your transmitter. And our transmitter has a repetition frequency that's out of sync of the big uh, transformers and uh, silicon controlled rectifiers. So uh, we can get rid of that noise. India is very easy to acquire data. Um, Germany has a lot of high voltage power lines and the trains are the problem in Germany, the 16 to 3 hertz. Um, but India is easy. Of course, Delhi, inside Delhi, it will be difficult. Have you... Uh... Well, there was no problem with noise in India. It was just like, it was a piece of cake from a noise uh, viewpoint. Okay, I, I guess a follow-up to that would be um, where you've worked, what has been the most challenging uh, environment um, to get good data? Right next to Hannover, over a gas field. And we even asked them to turn off the um, cathodic protection. Uh, when we measure in North Dakota, we will also ask them to turn off the cathodic protection. Uh, cathodic protection goes often at seven hertz um, and their grounds are fantastic. They make the best grounds at the uh, protection points and then those are every few hundred meters. And uh, if you, have your transmitter anywhere nearby, then your currents go into that and you don't know what the hell is going on. Uh, the same thing in Germany we're not, uh, is not the noise from the power lines, but um, again in Niedersachsen where you had all of the Habsburgers and blah, 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 and the earth has been turned over. The forest roads are paved and they have water hydrants in the forests. Well, the problem is the water pipes are out of metal. And we once took us several days to figure out that our tr transmitter was crossing a water pipe and the current went into the water pipe. And we got all kinds of funny signals that we couldn't estimate. So those are the type of noises that are terrible because you just can't figure them out. Um, if you have any type of culture noise, you usually find ways to deal with it. But grounded structures can be a nightmare. The only thing you can do in those cases is to move your transmitter. Hmm. Okay. And you, ha you have options. So we like to have the transmitter close. 
because we don't want to have too much 3D structure between transmitter and receiver, but we can move our transmitter a significant uh, distance if it's high power. So we can move the transmitter around. We shouldn't be stuck to one location. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Hey, this is Aria and Kurt. I've got a question. Did I understand you correctly that in India today, it's mandatory to include EM in a, any major service? No, 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 in any a new expiration license. Okay. So they will carry out an EM survey marine at any new expiration license, and they will carry out an EM survey in any expiration license onshore. And these are political requirements because you said you're not sure whether the data... No, they're not political. Produced? They are all okay. based on the, on the work we did 1989 and the subsequent MT work that NGI did 20 years afterwards. They are not political. They go mm -hmm. from the technical side all the way through committees, all the way to the uh, directorate of hydrocarbon. And they have meetings of technical experts. And I've been invited to many of those over the past decades. And they write white papers. So they're not political. They also require EM for their um, uh, shale, uh, shale gas exploration programs. It's also in their white paper that they have to include electromagnetics in it. But requiring it and doing enough are two different things. In many cases, they acquire some EM data of various types. Nobody understands them and they don't use them because it's just a requirement. It will take time for them to absorb it. It's a generation change, but they're training it. They, they have had for over 10 years routine trainings in this um, of the explorationists. And another question, when we're talking about monitoring and dense data, what role do you see in the temporal resolution? So basically you were talking about spatial resolution, but what about time? So do you, especially in, in, in contrast to um, seismic monitoring, do you see any uh, that, advantages, that's, disadvantages that's, for that's EM not monitoring? That's not temporary resolution, that's method resolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because temporary resolution <coughs> gets down to GPS timing. The method resolution is that when you look at earthquake applications, and if you imagine a reservoir being made of grains and pores, the grains contain the fluid. So now you are looking for seismic events and I'm now comparing to micro seismic, not to reflection seismic. So when you look for seismic events, you get a seismic event when the grain to grain contact breaks. Then you get a PNS wave emitted. And uh, before the grain to grain contact breaks, you have a shaking of the grains and the pore space. The minute you are shaking a mixed fluid volume, the water that is dissolved in the, in the fluid that is unoriented through the shaking will orient itself and the dipole water molecules will connect and you get a huge resistivity contrast, humongous. So from modeling, we understand that the response to those type of changes is very, very strong. Um, give you an example. I didn't even look at the data for one year because I didn't think it was possible. We were looking at 10 meter reservoir changes between oil and water at um, three and a half kilometer steps in the Barken in North Dakota. And we couldn't believe it. It was humongous. It was like 10% or something like this. And we only did it by accident. Finally, a student calculated it. And I said, oh, this is incredible. Um, so, from all of the modelings we have done and talk to microseismic people, you get a microseismic signature in about 3% uh, percent of the fracking events. When you only can use fracking to have a controlled mechanism. So in 3% of the fracking events, you get a microseismic signature. I'm predicting when a rock breaks, you always get an EM signature because the resistivity contrast by aligning the water content in the fluids is tremendous. That means the resistivity changes in most cases by a factor of 10 and more. Um, and I've looked at several hundred reservoirs with this. So it's, the resistivity changes through fluid substitution are always big. And that simply is related to water aligning, 
and electrons getting conducted. And as soon as you have electrons flow where you didn't have some before, it's big. Uh, now, in areas like the Imperial Valley, where you have low resistivity, low contrast uh, terrestrial sediments or BORIC, that may be different, but there are not many areas like that around this world. So that's my prediction. I'm hoping there will be more application and somebody will prove the prediction or will show us what the limitations are. All right, thank you, Kurt. Um, I guess uh, there's a question. Um, have uh, you or your colleagues uh, applied uh, machine learning uh, tools to your EM surveys or your EM data sets? No, I'm trying to avoid that question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and we know the sweet spot for that. Um, we have applied it. Um, and um, there are limitations, but they're not with machine learning. They are with the geophysical understanding of how and where you need to apply it. And you actually need to put the right process in place and apply it where you are doing cost savings. Um, and that means that you need to do it by replacing the 3D modeling with machine learning. So um, definitely that's an area um, of interest. The question is who is getting the value? Mm. And I can see that the value generated is on the user side, not on the technology developer side. Uh, so that's why what we saw at the last SEG was scientifically um, underwhelming because you have to use this and get the value out of it. And then you will really see the potential of that. Um, so much uh, I can say about it at this point. And we've tried it in the borehole because in the borehole, when you measure uh, six data points per meter, you have at every data point a complete 3D model to solve. So if you have 10 different measurements and multiple frequencies, uh, you can imagine that breaks down uh, any supercomputer in no time if you want to invert the data. So that's why ball measurements are mostly imaged, not inverted. Um, and so we tried it in the borehole. It's a very, 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 very complicated process. And that's where you will probably see this being applied first because the value generation will be there first. But then it depends who, who gets the value, the service company or the oil company and who is gonna pay for the development. True, good points. Um, all right, does anybody else uh, have any additional questions to ask Kurt? All right, well, uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask afterwards, you can always send them to me at my email address that I just put in the chat for everybody. All right, Kurt, excellent. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, close out the, the webinar. Uh, thank you, Kurt, and thank all of you for attending the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar uh, today as part of our webinar series, Geophysics for Today and Tomorrow. Please look for our social media posts and check out SEG Live on the SEG homepage to register for future uh, presentations. Uh, this is uh, part two of a part three series that Kurt has created for us uh, for the Europe Regional Advisory Committee on uh, electromagnetics. So if you'd like to learn more, please join us at uh, the beginning of next year. Um, not sure if it's going to be January or February for the next webinar, the final webinar in this three-part series. So thank you all again for attending and thank you, Kurt, very much for an excellent presentation. And we hope everyone has a great day. All right. Thank you very much. And everybody be safe, please.